In a tourist guide to South America, Penn sketches of one of the most notorious Nazi war criminals, Adolf Eichmann, drawn by Eli Mann of the Israeli Secret Service, who physically caught Eichmann in Argentina in 1960, spent more than a week there in hiding in a safe house, then together with the Israeli team, got him to Jerusalem for trial, where two years later, Eichmann was hanged. One of those ultimately responsible for the greatest mass murder in history, Adolf Eichmann, SS Obersturmbannführer, Gestapo, head of Department 4B4, Jewish section, was found in Buenos Aires by Israeli agents 15 years after the war, living under the name of Ricardo Clement. He was captured on May the 11th, 1960. Ten days later, Eli Mann disguised Eichmann as one of an El Al crew in readiness to fly him to Israel. The first thing when I took him uh, that day, he felt, you know, the people uh, that day were very nervous. And he felt it, you know, in the air. And he told me, what's going on? I said, this is the day you're going to go to Jerusalem. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem? Are you going to kill me? Again, all the time. When he, when he, I said, no, you're going to Jerusalem for a trial. And he was sitting in the mirror, and I made his eyes, his hair, and, and uh, put on him this uniform and the hat. And suddenly, I say, look, you look good. And he looked at me in the mirror and start to feel like a new man. Again he felt himself in the uniform. Again he felt himself good. Do you plead guilty or not guilty to the 15th count? In the spirit of the indictment, not guilty. Eli, until now, has never spoken publicly of his unique experience. So from the moment you got the order to catch him, then you uh, lived with it, you lived with this idea. I felt, I lived, in a way, I want to tell my mother, but I thought she ought to know, not because I'm a strong man, I'm going to do it. I wanted to be happy. In the, in the other way, I was afraid she would be afraid that I'm doing it. So I didn't tell her. I never told her, only when she was dying. And I said here to my mother, here is Eli, didn't move, here is Eli. Moved. Suddenly, she moved, the first time she said, and gave me her hand, in my hand, and she said, Eli. And I said, I captured Eichmann, I Captured Eichmann. He said, Eli. And then it was the end. I remember how many times I talked with her. I didn't want to hear about the killing of my relatives and my sister and her children. Whenever she talked about it, I went away. I was a small boy, I didn't understand. But the moment they told me, you're going to capture Eichmann, I was really another man. I wasn't, I wasn't myself. I, I, I tried to explain myself, what is it? So in one way, he was the man who sent to the trains, to the camps, 
six million Jews and another, about another six million of other people, gypsies, black, uh, Polish, I don't know, and even German. I couldn't realize six million people dying or one million of children. You couldn't, you think about it, it's horrible and you don't, couldn't realize in truth what is it. So one way, I looked in as a monster, because everybody said, he is a monster. But when I saw him, it was a man walking. It was not a monster. A real man is walking like me and you, and not, nothing special. Was it one of your tasks to talk with him? No, I got an order not to talk to him. And I was sitting there, and I said, to hell with this order. What's the big secret about taking, uh, talking to a criminal who killed so many people? Why shouldn't I talk to him? There's no reason. It is the same order that he got with no reason. I'm not going to, to listen to it. I didn't even think one moment, and I talked to him. But I felt it's like a wall of glass is separating me and him. I could see him but I couldn't hear him well. And not once I was standing beside him when he was asleep, very heavily sleep, asleep. You can see. And I said to myself, how could I penetrate his brain that once in his lifetime that he will tell the story and not be afraid to uh, make mistakes, not so systematically. And whatever I tried in any way, and there were moments I thought he's going to tell me everything, and suddenly it came back to the same road we started. The first time when I was told and I took on myself to do it by myself, I felt not a fear, I felt a responsibility that I have to do it in any way. I have to bring this man because I knew it's not only our team wants it. There was millions of people who waited that this man will be brought and, and put on a trial. And if you take uh, the meaning, who is this man? If you lose him this time, you'll never see him again in your life. And I would feel so bad about it all my life. So I said, it should be done. And I practiced with no, non-stop, I would say, from the moment till the moment I captured him. How long did it take? It took about one and a half months. The one thing what I have to do is to capture him physically, to capture him, to carry him, to put him in the car. Eichmann and his family lived poorly in a remote suburb of Buenos Aires. Right there, it was a deserted place, San Fernando, the, uh, the house of uh, in the Garibaldi Street. You have no reason to stay there in the, this bloody cold weather. No reason for tourists. It's only if you are, you didn't find your way. But standing there, if the police would see me there, they will ask me, I, I couldn't give them a good answer. Only by smiling, talking them beautifully, and that's all. I could see from there where the bus, the stop, uh, the stop of the bus from Eichmann comes, the whole road of Garibaldi Street could see the house of Eichmann and the big window, they could see the movement inside. There I could see him arriving, could see the light, could see his child, sometimes his other boys, big boys, child of six years old. I could see his wife, pet wife called Eva, and I could see him. It was so cold, and the rain, and the thunders, horribly. And he was walking, you know, 
with his coat. Now the problem was not only where I'm going to meet him, how am I going to meet him in a place that the car will be near and I will arrive exactly in front of him and what speed I need to go that he wouldn't be frightened, wouldn't run away and how would it look to him my coming and the parking of the car it was like when he goes out, down I said down from the from the from his the bus like one two three four stop one two three four six seven eight nine ten I started like it was a parallel for my thinking about the motions parallel the the counting of the spaces and where it will stop and everything 40 is near his house 50 60 you know all the time the counting till it came to me like a blank of a operation with spaces and numbers that i know where i'll be where the car will be and suddenly i saw the plane the main car should be very near to the scene when i capture him that will be 20 seconds, it should be very near, put him in and go away. Now, Issa and Hans believe that when he will see the car parking there, he wouldn't go. And I said, yes, he will go. Because he's a German man, he always did it, and he is used to it, and he will walk through. He will Nothing. Walk towards his house. You towards mean. his house, he will see a parking, a parking car, which, you know, the hood is up like something happened in the rain, and he even he will be frightened. It could be. I don't mind. He will walk. It bothered me all the time when I capture him, because my exercise were have done, I have to hold his mouth in a way that he wouldn't shout. And I couldn't stand it that I hold his mouth and feeling his wetness I had to do something there will be something between me and my hand and his in his mouth even I liked it much better like this because more flexible even it was very cold I prefer the gloves and when I put the gloves on it is not like you know you touch a face or you touch a hand. An open mouth is something, uh, for me it was something that I couldn't do it if I hadn't the gloves. Did you ever have the fear that it wouldn't succeed? You know, till you don't do these things, it's always you have this fear, even you don't admit it. Now, how I acted normally is, when I was with a team, I kept my fear to myself. But for sure, there was a fear, maybe I wouldn't do it. Then the zero hour came. When the zero hour came, we were standing like this. Mayor and me were near the open hood, covered that Eichmann couldn't see anybody, and the two people in, in the car, non-seen, like it was a deserted car, a black, I think a black Mercedes, old one that we fixed it from the beginning and it was the diplomatic numbers these guys with mud that you couldn't see the whole number you knew exactly at what hour he would normally be in the bus? normally he when he came about about we looked every half hour was was a bus it was about around eight o'clock uh, around eight o'clock half past seven I would say at that time half past seven we have been there a little bit earlier and we've been ready and suddenly they came up to come a bicycle for a man there and asked he wants to help us he said no no so suddenly it happened that it didn't arrive he was a little bit late I came nearer to the car and I heard Hans telling me look Maybe he arrived and we didn't see him. 
So I said, oh no, I'm not going to repeat this, this story. I told him, I said, I'm not going to repeat this all kind of standing and waiting anymore. But I had a sign the first time when he arrived. He always, when he arrived home, there was a little bit more light in the house. And I said, no, Hans, the light is not enough. He is not there. And I moved from the car. I didn't want to hear anymore because any talking would take me out of the concentration. I again stepped back to be ready. And then about 20 minutes later... You were armed? No, never. Never I was armed. Weren't you afraid that he was armed? I wasn't afraid, but later when I arrived, start to move, when he moved from his side, he went down, there was a woman there, and I said, hell, he's coming with a woman. The woman moved to the right side, to my right side, and she left to other place. And he start to move, step by step. Uh, I could hear, you know, the noise of his boots. I think the only boots were left from the SS. <laughs> and and uh, when I was very near to the car, I heard him saying to me, uh, look, his hand is in, in his pockets in his pocket. Maybe he's armed. Maybe he has a pistol. I said to myself, well, I don't want to hear any more. I don't want to hear nothing about a pistol. Because I have to change all my way of, of holding him. But it came into my brain. I couldn't change it. So when I came near to him, and I, hundreds of times, I said, uno momentito, senor. Uno momentito, senor. And suddenly I felt it doesn't doesn't come right in my mouth. I said, uno momentito. I saw him. I could see his eyes. He was frightened. He started in a way to retreat one step. I said, to help with everything, I jumped on him. I hold his hand to see maybe he has uh, the pistol. And I hold him with the other hand and we uh, fell together into the ditch. But I, I haven't forgotten the order that he wouldn't be wounded, and I fall on my knees, and I pushed him near my and uh, near me, and hold his head. And suddenly I heard a shout, a cry. It was the strongest cry I could hear because, and I hold back his head, that he couldn't open his mouth. And I took him on my shoulders and brought him up the ditch, and then came Mayer, put him into the car, closed the car, and we put him to the rear side, and we moved. And then what kind of feeling did you have? It's really a, a feel. I felt very happy from the moment I got him into the car, and we moved on our way. With no problem, I felt myself free man. You know, people say sometimes, look, but he was such a big, you know, criminal. This I didn't think about it. Just thought about one thing. I'm free of my commitment. I said, to hell with him. It's all yours. Do with him whatever you want. I don't want to hear about it anymore. It was really a burden on my shoulders. I have to do it. I was free. I felt so good. And I saw him ly lying in the car. And suddenly he caught me something, you know. A man, 56 years old, laying, couldn't move. He's so lost. And it struck me that a man like me, he, he wasn't a monster. He was a normal man, lying, and couldn't move. And uh, and uh, and he as and he is the man who did all these things. He didn't shoot because he was a normal man. And I remember 
that the first thing he, w he was said in the car that Hans told him, if you say one word, you'll be dead. And I felt in my hand, because I hold his mouth, he said, he knows it, it's okay. And I said, it's okay. At the safe house, a suburban villa, Eichmann was put into a room with Eli. There they would remain for the next clothes, 10 days. Clothes, I took off his clothes, and we had the pyjama, strip pyjama, and everything was ready for him. The first thing, we asked him, who are you? He said, Ricardo Clement. Hans asked him, who are you? Ricardo Clement. Clement Ricardo. He didn't want to say that he is Eichmann. In a way, in the first moment, there was a doubt. Maybe we are mistaken, but we have our list of identi uh, identi Fiction. identifications. He took off his, he took off everything of him, and he was naked, standing. And then we see the scar of the, you know, the SS. Have, everybody has a number, but he disguised his with kind of operation. We couldn't see the number, but was on the right place. The second was he had an accident. And we could see the accident in the right place. The measurement of the head, his four teeth. I saw step by step, there was about seven or ten questions. Suddenly he saw it's a lost case. The first time he said, I am Adolf Eichmann. It was all in German? It was all in German, he said. Ich bin Adolf Eichmann. Das war das erste Mal, er hat das gesagt. He was really a man who didn't know what to do with himself. Somebody asked the question, said, who do you think caught you? And he said, the Israelis. He didn't doubt one, one, one moment. He said immediately the Israelis said, why? Later when I talked to him, he said, look, it's about 15 years I waited, it will happen to me. And suddenly what I believed happened. I looked at him, he was uh, blindfolded, a pyjama with stripes, is uh, no shoes, a chain attached to his one foot, the left foot, uh, to the rail of the bed, and it was all the time, you know, I looked at him full of tense, his face was full of tense, you know, clutching his teeth, like, and uh, even I didn't see his eyes, like, thinking, what happened to me? Uh, what could I do? It was full of tense. You saw his movement of, in one way, it was very strange. He was afraid to move his body because we told him, lay like this, this. And he, like a German, if he w wouldn't get another order, he wouldn't, he wouldn't move. Very tense. And he said, are you the man, when I said a word or something, he said, are you the man who captured me? And I said, yes. And then I, I left him a little bit to relax. And I said, I saw your boy, the fine boy. I think his age is six years old because I knew everything about his file. His blonde hair, blue eyes. You know what? He reminds me so much about the boy of my sister. I said, what happened to him? I said, nothing happened. I said, only one thing I know, that you boy is alive and the boy of my sister is dead. That's the only difference. He said, 
What happened to my family? I said, nothing. Are you going to kill me? I said, if we wanted to kill you, we could shoot you so easily from the, the, the place we saw. We saw you from the observation point. I said, I saw you so many times playing with the boy and talking to your wife through the big window. And I saw you, you remember, when the train is going through, you counted with your child the wagons. You like trains. And I tell you also that I like also trains. And your child also likes trains. Everybody likes trains. But do you remember what you have done? with his own hands. It was his word that put gas chambers into action. He lifted the telephone and railroad cars left for the extermination centers. His signature it was that sealed the doom of thousands and tens of thousands. The Nazi caught the woman. She held the baby in her arms and began asking for mercy that she be shot first and leave the baby alive. From behind the fence, there were Polish people who raised their hands ready to catch the baby. She was about to hand the baby over the fence. The Nazi took the baby from her arms shot the woman twice and then took the baby in his hands and tore him as one would tear a rag. Are you going to kill me? He said, no. We are going to, to bring you to a trial, to a fair trial. That what you have never did never done, you never thought about, about to do with you victim. said, but, look, it was an order. I never did it. It was an order. It was the fear. I said, what kind of an order is this? He said, and you, you are not a soldier. You have not your orders. You captured me. How did you do it? By an order. It was not so fast as I say. It took time. And we talked mm, broken German, as I talked, and half Yiddish. And he understood well what I mean. I had a lot of time to talk to him again and again. And he said, I said to him, yes, I got an order to capture him. But it's one big difference between me and you. You did it to people, to innocent people. They've done nothing only because you hated these people. What have done? You know, you have transferred about one million children. What could they do? And I think about the children of my sister, three, one. What could they do? One a year? Two years, six years. Think about your child. And you tell me it's an order? So I came to capture you, I have an order to capture criminals. But you did it to innocent people. And that's the big difference between me and you. That I never did it. Uh, I, in a way, love Jews. Say, so you love Jews? Say, yes. I want them to have their country. We want it. I want to send them away. We didn't want to do anything to the Jews, but nobody wants to accept them. The first, we just talked about Judenrein, clean the Jews from Germany. There was no one nation who wanted to accept them. We thought about Madagascar and all these kind of plans. I even was in Israel in 1936. He said, I even know Hebrew. He said, what kind of Hebrew do you know? He said, could you show me something? He said, 
And he started to give the alphabet a Hebrew, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Va. It was a strange to hear from Eichmann talking Hebrew. And suddenly in the end he said, he knew Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, which is the most sacred, you know, saying in Hebrew. And I was thrilled. I said to hell. And I said, how did you learn it? He said, when I went in 36, I prepared myself with a rabbi uh, to know Hebrew. I said, why did you need the Hebrew? He said, because we wanted to know when I came to the Juden uh, apartment, Jewish ap uh, department, they said, I want to know everything, what the Jews do, and how they react, and what they know. I want to learn Hebrew to understand them better. Understand them better. No, maybe for killing and for sending people to do their death, you don't have to know their language. They couldn't make any mistake. It was very annoying. When he said this saying of Shema Israel, and I was from a religious ha home, and I've learned in the religious school, it disturbed me. And this was one of the time I said I would knock out you all the teeth. You bloody bastard, you are going, you're talking this kind of sentence that, that Jews and people being killed for this world, when they when they died, in 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 a, in a way, they say the sentence, the last sentence before they died, they said, and he have learned it because to make them die. Eli, did you get an answer on your question why he did it? It's a hard question that I asked myself later after the operation. The answer is no. And I don't think that even Eichmann knew the answer. I never got a, 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 an answer, and I think he didn't know how to answer. Because in a way, I identity, uh, he identi identified himself, identified. identified himself so much with the Führer, with the system, that he couldn't get out of it. Because an order and the love of the fear, the love of his camera, the loyalty, I would say, not love, was so strong that I felt all the time when I talked to him, even I felt some kind of friendship, or I would say more a relationship between me and him that some fate brought us in one room. I, the small boy from Poland, and he, the one who was the master there, I felt it in a way that's against my, my behaving, against my nature, that I have to hold the man against his will. Even I knew what he has done. In a way, I felt bad about it. And he, in a way, uh, after a while, we became related to each other and he was very dependent on me because every move he asked me what normal people wouldn't ask if i took off his blindfold he would hold his eyes closed i said open your eyes he wouldn't dare open his eyes even i took off his blindfold he was so obeying everything it made me sick Move your, hair, your leg, he would move his leg. So even to go to the toilet, say, could I? He was sitting there. Could I start? Like this. I'm not joking. It was something I couldn't understand. Who is, uh, what Israeli or human being would wait? He is in the toilet to ask, could I start in the toilet? It was something... I was laughing in the, in, in the moment when he asked this question and Uzi was beside me and said, I understand this kind of question, but in a way, I felt that the human being could be so low and so trained 
that everything should be an answer and uh, an agreement. Okay, do it. It was something like an automat, like an, a robot, in a way. And I, what I wanted to him, to give him a situation that you can become again the human being. That in a situation that then I can tell him, look, Eichmann, why don't you tell me about the other people, about Mengele, about the other criminals? And because it's, it's about time that you wouldn't do all, the, you wouldn't take on your shoulder all the crime. But in the moment you want to ask him, he came back into his shell and then it stood again beside you a robot and not a human being. And that's what disappointed me so much. I want to just give him a knock on his head, not because I want to strike him, because I hated him was to take out, to let him out of the shell what was hiding in it. You understand? And this was not a shell was created when I captured him. It was a shell was created from the Nazi regime. Do you know you that the know International the Military Brown. Tribunal at Nuremberg Sentenced Goering, Frank, and others to death for the share they had in the killing of the Jews. Yes. They were people who gave orders. And you believe that those sentences were just? Yes, as I said this morning, the responsibility should be borne by those who gave the orders, not by those who received them. He again and again was sure that we are going to kill him. And I promised him again and again that nobody will touch him, that he go, is going to be transferred to Israel. When he heard Israel, he was so frightened, he said, no. I'm ready for everything, but don't send me to Israel. Because you have to understand, it is like a Jew going to Germany, standing trial in time of the Nazis. And he felt the same, if he goes to Israel, everybody's a Jew, Israeli, what chance he has there? Eli desperately wanted Eichmann to agree to go to Jerusalem, and finally got him to sign a document admitting to his identity and his wish to achieve peace of mind. I didn't know what to do with him. I took off his uh, blindfold. I left him attached to the bed. And I went up to another second story that I knew that Hoffman holds his wine and records in chocolate. Because he was a man, he likes, you know, to play the record, to drink his wine, eat his chocolate, and nobody knew about it. I said to hell, I'm going to give him, I said, I asked him, I want to give him something, a feeling of a human being, not as a prisoner. And I said to myself, do you like wine? I asked him, he said, oh, I have so gern wine. Oh, this wine? He was crazy about the wine. I said to hell, I go bring the wine. And I went up, brought the wine, and I said, and I brought all the record and the machine <laughs> he has there. And I put the machine, you know, the record player, and there, what he bought there was a flamenco, like this, I remember, and I put it in a low, that you, the people wouldn't hear, because they say, the man came out, it's crazy, what is it? I put the record, and I gave him a glass of wine, and I drank the glass of wine. And he said, Miss Cole, I don't know what he said. I said, to hell with you, and we drank the wine. I said, ah, ich hab so gern wine. And then I gave him a cigarette, and he started to smoke it, you know. So he smoked it till the last piece 
I thought it's going to burn his finger. He smoked it and said, why do you do it for me? I said, I don't know, I don't hate you. I felt I want to do it for you. And I said, Eichmann, I think you're mistaken about signing to Jerusalem. Once in your lifetime, I think, I'm not going to order you to do it, I just tell you, as I, I believe I would do, if I was Eichmann, I would do it like this. I would sign the papers, and I tell you why. It's the only time in your lifetime that you have the opportunity to tell what you think. And you will stand there in Jerusalem and tell the whole world what you think was right in your own words. And you have the chance to bring your lawyer and your wife can come there. My wife? Yes, your wife. I think nobody will stop your wife to come there. Even your son. And you have the opportunity, not like the Jews, they have no opportunity, or the other people who have been arrested by you, they have no opportunity to say a word. And this will be your time to say the word, what happened. And I'm sure you're not the only one who is responsible for it. And you, you have also the chance to say who are the people who have been responsible. And don't take it only that you have been the only one. Nobody can create such a machine, and for sure not Eichmann alone. And suddenly he, he drank another glass of wine, and he was walking around. But everything was asked, could I stand up? I said, yes. Stand near the mirror, see yourself. And I was going away to the side of the room and looked at him. I saw him straighten up a little bit himself. As he talking to himself in front of the mirror and making the calculation. And suddenly he saw, he asked me, where's the paper? I said, here's the paper. He said, Eli. I want a sign. I'll go to Jerusalem. And he signed the paper and drank the wine. He asked him for another cigarette. I gave him the cigarette and we smoked. And I felt in this thing what he has done, he touched me in a way that I knew how much it was. he was worried to do it. And I said, I did it. And then I gave him the blindfold there, he put it there, I helped him to do it. He laid on the bed and I asked him, okay now, Aishma, you've done a very good thing. You wouldn't regret it. I promise you that I'll come to visit you in Jerusalem. He said, you'll come? I said, yes. You saw the Jew as an opponent. Is that true? Yes, I saw them as opponents, but may I now add an explanation why I did so. I regarded the Jews as opponents, but not as opponents who must be exterminated. I regarded the Jews as opponents with regard to whom a mutually acceptable, a mutually fair solution must be found. He fell to the ground and into the pit amongst the many dead bodies. I heard the shots and then I was praying for another bullet to put an end to my suffering. I saw them. 
In the queue. Uh, uh, President of course, uh, Mr. Dinos, uh, please, please listen to Mr. Hausner and to me. Please stay in your seats. Please be good enough and remain where you are. You told the court that you do not consider yourself an anti-Semite and that you never were an anti-Semite. An anti-Semite I never was, no. Do you will agree with me, this is paradoxical. A convinced National Socialist who is not a convinced anti-Semite. My attitude at that time was like that of many other people. Nothing is ever as bad as it appears, or one could put it, Nothing is ever eaten as hot as when it is cooking. To exterminate the Jews was regarded as a glorious deed. They had to be exterminated the way bacteria and any other disease had to be fought and conquered. Uh, yes, I have to admit this. It is quite correct. I had the feeling of Pontius Pilate. I felt it was not with me that the guilt lay. I had to do it. But what was done was not my doing. I felt that I was not guilty because what was being laid down at the Banzi conference was done by the elite, the popes, as it were, of the state. And I had to toe the line, of course, willy-nilly. That is what I thought in the course of the years which followed. And this is how I found justification of what I did. I went into, into the court, I saw the judges and Black and the prosecutor, and I saw this glass uh, boot, Eichmann inside, with a suit. It wasn't the same one, same man. It looks to me more uh, confident, with confidence, and I start to push my way through the benches near a place that I can face him. Step by step, I walked in till I came to the glass, and I heard the questions and the answers of Eichmann. He had long sentences, very long sentences. And I waited for the moment that he would raise his head and see me. I didn't know what kind of reactions would be, but I was excited in a way. In one question, before it was answered, he raised his head and looked at me and our eyes We've been connected. We looked at each other. And he didn't say a word. Just looked at me in a surprise. Like waiting, see, saying, you see, here I am in the boot glass. What do you say about it? I looked at him and I nodded my head. He saw me and he, his head went down and the question was repeated and he answered. I went back. I said, I have nothing to do anymore and I didn't want to hear the process. Before I went out, I said to myself, I looked around, I didn't recognize nobody and I said to myself, the only man who knows me here really is Eichmann. 